Hi, everybody. Welcome. Thanks for coming to my talk. It's good to be back. Last time I was here was just a few months before the pandemic. And um, as we were discussing before, it just like those years, just they didn't exist. There was 2019 and now there's here and it's, it's just good to be here. So uh, my name is Tim. That's true. I work for a company called StarTree. I run the developer relations team there. StarTree makes a cloud service based on a database called Apache Pino. This talk is called Making Kafka Queryable with Apache Pino. It is mostly a talk about Pino, but in my mind, Pino is an attempt to deal with the impact of Kafka on the world. And so really what this is, is I'm, I'm, I want to start with a little bit of historical context about why, you know, what's happening in the world of software as I see it. Um, and at the end, there's, there's kind of this other main motivator for Pino that's, that's sort of Kafka related. Uh, and in between, there's just gonna be a bunch of stuff about how Pino works. And if you've got questions, so apparently you can put the questions in through the app. Wow, that's wonderful what we can do nowadays. And so we'll have those after if you type them in. I don't know how you like to do questions. The cool thing about that is you can just enter the question when you have it, and we'll take it at the end completely out of context. Hey, we'll do our best. Uh, or you can just raise your hand and ask the question, and I'll repeat it. Everybody, However it works. I'll leave as much time as I can. All right, so um, also... There we are. Um, that QR code gets you to a Slack workspace where you can find me. I'm Tim Berglund. I'm not hard to find. I am told when I am in this part of the world that I don't pronounce my last name correctly. I regret the error. Um, I hope that you can work with me on that. Um, actually, one nice thing is I don't have to spell it. I check into a hotel, and I say it funny, but everybody knows how to spell it. In the U.S., in Minnesota, everybody knows how to spell it. The rest of the country, forget it. It's just a complete disaster. Um, anyway, um, yeah, so you can find me there in that Slack workspace. If you join that, if you live tweet this session, or if you write up a meaningful summary of it for your value of meaningful on LinkedIn, and you send me a link to that, I will send you things that can let you get a T-shirt. You all look like you probably have clothes to wear, but you know, if you want a T-shirt... <laughs> I'm your guy, and you could live, live tweet this session, and that's always great. So anyway, historical context helps me make sense of things, and so let's just dive in. Um, I just, I moved uh, a few months ago. I, I got married, and I moved to Mountain View, California, and um, I'm a few miles down the road from the Computer History Museum, which is an amazing place. I just was there last Friday. Uh, all kinds of really cool hardware. They have one of these. This is an IBM 1401. Uh, they run it every Saturday. I've not yet made it for one of those runs, but a uh, very cool thing. This is, uh, it's, I think, a little bit of a stretch to call it the first mainframe, but it was one of the first productized, broadly available mainframes uh, available for use, and it was a batch analytics machine. Literally, you prepared a batch of punch cards, you fed them in, and there was a program set up. It would, it would, aggregate and group and sort and output results. Batch analytics. That is the beginning of commercial computing. Maybe a decade later, uh, this is the IBM 2260, one of, I, I think actually their first productized dumb terminal that you could plug into machines like that and mainframes that they were making at the time. This is still a few years before the famous System 360 uh, that, that kind of changed the world of mainframes in the later 60s. But uh, the point being, Commercial computing began as this batch analytics thing. It wasn't until almost a decade later that the idea of transactional computing, typing stuff and interacting, made a difference. We've got this robust distinction between OLTP and OLAP and you know, transactional and analytics and all that kind of stuff, very important types of databases. Computers had to grow before that was even a meaningful thing that could happen, right? So you know, a decade into the game, you've got, you've got transactional data. All the data in the systems that, I'll say we, I wasn't alive yet, they built, our predecessors built back then, was still all in one place. And so you go from batch analytics to transactional, and it, you still want to do analytics on that transactional data, it's fine. Reporting is a feature of the software. You run reports, it prints out on green bar, all the data is in one place. It's a wonderful time to be alive, 
for some value of wonderful. And that paradigm survives for a few decades until this happens. Now, this is, in terms of my own lifespan, uh, around the time I start paying attention. I'm a relatively nerdy teenager. <laughs> no, I'm just a nerdy teenager. There's no relative about it. And um, PCs start happening. And I'm reading in the 80s these, these articles. I don't really understand any of this, but people are talking about this client-server revolution and this how this is upending computing and it's going to throw down the mainframe and it's this really, really crazy thing. And fair enough, this is, I'm going to say, simplifying things, the first real revolution in application architecture. Because instead of just all this code on the mainframe, the database is on the mainframe, everything's in one place, the interface is there, reporting, all that. Now you've got computers are good enough that there's actual meaningful compute, display, storage, I.O., interaction happening on the desktop. Where's the data go? In some closet in the office now, okay? Uh, now we have this idea of a departmental database server. And all of a sudden, instead of all the data being in the mainframe, and reporting being all in one place, and people being able to see what's going on, now the data is scattered in all these databases. This is kind of, uh, you know, 1990, let's think. Um, and it's kind of a mess. Because of this revolution in application architecture, where we go from mainframe to client server, and it, it, it happened, right? People found it compelling, and business software now was, by and large, new things were being written in this new client server paradigm. Uh, the data was kind of everywhere. And that caused a revolution in analytics. We have a transition in application architecture. That causes a transition in the way we do analytics. And that was the birth of the data warehouse. <clears throat> uh, was, again, a new idea circa 1990. Empires were built, billions of dollars in software sales, consulting, book publishing empires. Uh, it, was, it was an incredible thing. Uh, and a good idea, right? This took all that data in all those departmental database servers, put it back into one place so you could see what was going on in the world. Uh, a few years after that, the web happens, and this seemed like a big idea, or a big deal at the time. But in terms of application architecture, oddly, so when this browser was current, client server was a new idea. So all the people who were jumping on board this and, and building the web were using this new client server paradigm. They just picked it up, brought it over here, unchanged, and built websites with it because that was how we did things. So oddly, client server survives the internet transition without a whole lot of impact. It's, 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 it's kind of okay up until the time it isn't. Same with analytics. We've got data warehousing. We're still doing that same thing. Now, after 10 or 15 years, it starts to feel some pressure. And this is what a stable diffusion algorithm uh, gave me to interpret uh, the idea of big data. And I love it so much. I just can't, I just never want to stop using this, this picture. Um, but yeah, around 2010, we've got Hadoop and its children and grandchildren. And now the data warehouse becomes the data lake, which superficially seems like a very different thing. But fundamentally, you still got all this data out there. And what you're doing is you're taking it in big batches and you're putting it from over there to here. And then you're doing stuff with it. You're just doing that bigger, right? So paradigm wise, um, some things changed, but fundamentally, I don't really think they did. Application-wise, also, there's pressure. That whole, okay, here's a database. It's the center of my world. I'll build an application around it. Pretty soon, by around the time this elephant becomes a thing, we start using a, a, a dirty word for that. We start calling that a monolith, and it's bad, and we have to do things differently. We have to build microservices now, and that was kind of terrible, actually, at first. Most people just failed at that, and it was a bad idea that people like me popularized. I didn't myself, but you know, people on this end of the, the projector said it was a great idea, and it took a while for that really to work. Um, but this was the client-server paradigm starting to break down. We had to start to, to come up with a different way of building software, which was lots of different services that talk to each other rather than, than the one big program. This is a second revolution in application architecture. The first was client server 30 years ago, and now we've got uh, what, I'll, what I'll call event-driven architecture, uh, the, the death of the monolith. Around this same time, smartphones, just keep that in mind. Now, instead of having to go to a place and do a thing to use the internet, it's just a part of the fabric of our lives, and increasingly our commercial and social lives are mediated electronically through devices, and we expect things to happen right away. You don't go and check on what things are as if you're going to get a 
uh, update in the mail in four to six weeks or you know the next day an email you expect the thing in your pocket to wiggle when something changes all of this and i realize this is a very quick history i have this ambition someday i want to do this as like a whole talk and really do it in more detail i don't know if anyone will ever come so anyway uh, this kind of gets us to kafka right all of these things bring us to where we are now, which is rather than monoliths as the default application architecture for business software, we've got microservices. By default, those services are talking to each other through event logs that are generally Kafka topics. This is sort of where we are. Um, and now the world, instead of living in a database, increasingly the world lives as events in a log. And this is how we understand things. Uh, this is this is the, the the fundamental abstraction on which we we more and more are building systems. Databases don't go away. There are probably more databases than ever, but the the default home for things is a log. Now, uh, that's cool, except uh, logs are real hard to query. That's that's kind of the bad thing about them. They're real easy to scan. They're real easy to to oh dear to get the next message from, uh, but you can't ask a log what has happened. You can't say, hey, help me understand you know, what's happened in the last five minutes of the last hour. Which brings us to, you know, with that historical context, kind of the actual topic of our talk, which is Apache Pino. Pino is a real-time analytics database. And for there to be any new database at all, ever, I think there has to be a real good reason. So I give you that historical context to give you some idea of why Pino and databases like it exist. That's because what we're experiencing now is, and again, I realize these are giant sweeping generalizations, but I think they're defensible. The second major revolution in application architecture. The first was when I was a teenager, client server. The second is now event-driven application architecture uh, as, as a default paradigm, I think. The way we are learning to build applications, microservices on top of Kafka, is a basic paradigm that's going to, 30 years from now, there are you know, people right now who are learning how to eat food and walk around and things like that, that 30 years from now, they'll be software engineers still using that paradigm, which by then maybe will be tired and be replaced by something else, which creates the need for things like Pino. I will leave that claim there, we'll come back to that at the end. And, and flesh that out a little bit more, but let's jump in and look at how Pino works. Okay, um, there's a helpful block diagram. Thank you for coming. Okay, let's actually, let's, let's try and break that down a little bit more. Um, Pino stores data in tables. Uh, that's super comforting because everything else is kind of a pain. You know how tables work. There are columns, they have names, they have types. What else is there to say? Um, they are, yeah, the fundamental place where, where data goes. Um, they're broken into things called segments, which are like shards of tables. Um, in Pino, there is no create table statement. Um, there, is, uh, there are a couple of JSON config files. So uh, schema and all the other details of table configuration are broken out as separate things. So if you have multiple tables with the same schema, you've got that one file, but you can define like different indexing schemes and ingestion schemes and, and things like that. Uh, there are tables that are formed from batch data. Those have the rather unfortunate name offline tables. I assure you, offline tables are quite online and queryable all the time. Absolutely terrible name, but hey, we, go, we work with what we've got. Um, uh, Real-time tables are things that are ingesting from a streaming source, and you could have hybrid mixes of those. Uh, again, tables are built or split up into these things called segments. Uh, these are basically uh, kind of like time partitions of data. A segment will be, you know, in physical terms, a few hundred megabytes of data. So that's, you know, whatever number of rows that, that represents in the table. Uh, that's a segment. We split tables up into segments because we expect tables to get big, and we don't want to have them fit on one uh, computer. So uh, we'll break them into pieces. And uh, helpful property of segments is that they're immutable once written. That's both a nice simplifying assumption and a thing that can be a pain. If we have time, we'll talk about how we deal with uh, how we make that not a pain for those of us using Pinot, uh, that, that segments are immutable. 
so yeah, visually, that's what, you know, you get a table that's made up of segments. Um, and the, the structure of segments is interesting because Pinot is an analytics database. An analytics database is designed to, uh, really to filter and aggregate. Those are kind of the fundamental things that you do. If you're a transactional database, what do you want to do? You, you want to you wanna keep track of things, usually, right? You want to write a thing or read a thing or change a thing, and it's usually a thing. It doesn't have to be a thing. You, you can compute aggregations in a transactional database, but you're optimized for there are entities in the world that change, and you're trying to reflect those changes in the transactional database. So it's usually reading, writing, updating a, a single thing. Uh, updating is... is just fine, like you wanna, you wanna be able to do that lots. In a transactional, pardon me, an analytics database, you kinda wanna optimize for, let me read a bunch of some number and compute uh, an aggregate of it. Or read a bunch of some number and group it up relative to some other dimension and aggregate those groups. Those, those kind of things. It's, so transactional is this thing, analytic is these things. That's the, the basic idea. Because of that, if you look in a segment, um, and say we've got these, this JSON record that's like clickstream data or something like that, um, Pinot stores all the columns together. So for however many rows are represented in this segment, all of the values of each column are stored, are, are written sequentially, therefore they are readable sequentially. Therefore you're able to optimize sorting and indexing and things like that for in, you know, for certain queries to be able to read, say, uh, we want to compute an average of bytes, right? Uh, we'll be able to look in that bytes section and we'll actually get all those columns together and you can, you can sequentially read some chunk of those in an efficient way. So that's, that's when a database is described as column oriented. That's specifically what it means. At the storage level, the columns are written together. Nowhere inside a segment will you ever have all the bytes of a single row serialized together. So it's relatively harder in a database that's optimized for, for OLAP queries to get things out of it. You know, you've got to go find the columns in all the places in the segment file, whereas a transactional database, all that stuff's in one place because you're optimizing for that operation. So segment structure is like that. You got these... Lots of these segments, and those live on a machine called a server. It's a very original name. Uh, servers do kind of most of the work in Pinot. They store the data. Uh, they're responsible for, for, they can replicate segments between themselves. And most of the computation of actual queries is done on servers. Uh, there's a reason for that. Pinot describes itself as a real-time analytics database. Uh, probably most of you in this room, when I use a phrase like real-time analytics database, maybe a little part of you dies, uh, because what does that even mean, right? That's like some product marketing team came up with that. Um, well, let's just take a minute. Um, it came to life at LinkedIn, which is the same place where Kafka was born. Uh, and it was not the same team, but it was a nearby team. And it was about three years later after LinkedIn had created Kafka and was kind of reshaping their analytics pipelines to be these event-driven things, um, they realized that uh, doing analytics, doing actual analytics queries over those Kafka topics at scale wasn't a thing that was easy in Kafka itself. And they needed a place to take that data to be able to do those queries. Well, you could have dumped it into Hadoop at the time, right? That would have been fine. But, you know, or in modern terms, that's like taking a Kafka topic and putting all the events in a data lake so you can run, I don't know, Spark jobs over it or something like that. That's a, that's a batch operation. So you're taking this gigantic real-time engine that you've engineered and slowing it down into batch mode, which, you know, that might be 15 seconds to run a job or something like that. That might not be a terrible latency, but what they wanted to do was have these queries actually in the user interaction loop. So somebody would, will say, load a page on LinkedIn. The specific feature was actually who viewed my profile. Um, they were trying to make LinkedIn a thing that you'd want to go back to like more often than just adding contacts. Um, 
And so in, in loading a page, they actually wanted to go do analytics queries and return those results live. So when I say real time, terrible, squishy, imprecise term, what I mean is kind of in that user interaction layer. So I, I you know, tap a thing on a mobile app, something happens and I, I see a result. Meal delivery is another giant Pinot use case. Um, you know, at calculating like average delivery time on, a, on an order, that's a thing that you expect to change when you tap on a, a result, you expect to see things happen, not 15, 20 seconds later when, when some batch job has the chance to, to run. Anyway. Why did I say any of that? Oh, because servers store that, well, number one, it's important to define what real time means, but servers store segments and servers do most of the query, the, the computation involved in processing a query. And the fact that you've got the, the processor, the SSD, a PCI channel there, I mean, just think of it at that low level. Um, that's, that's where most of the work is being done. So you've got tightly coupled compute and storage. And if you're going to do queries, you know, analytics queries over very large data sets where you're filtering and aggregating and you need to get them done in 40 milliseconds or 50 milliseconds, you're going to need that kind of tightly coupled compute and storage. So that's, that's why that architecture. All right. Then you've got these brokers, brokers uh, kind of know where the segments are, and they've got a certain amount of metadata about maybe like minimum and maximum values in segments and time frames in segments and things like that. So they might be able to do a good job scattering and gathering results or scattering to, we'll say, the smallest number of servers possible uh, to get a query done. It's a little more complicated than that because... Sometimes you don't quite want the smallest number, but you definitely want the, don't want the largest number. It's query routing is, 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 again, actually worth a whole hour, but that's not our time today. So the broker takes a query, figures out where it needs to go, sends it to those servers. They do their work, and they send results back to the broker, which can then send results back to the client. This just got a little more complicated in Pino 1.0, which was released last month. Uh, there's a video online that you could find on the Star Tree YouTube. Or you just go to pinot.apache.org. The video should be. Is the video there? It would be terrible if it weren't. I'm not sure right now if the video is there. Go to pinot.apache.org. Maybe the video will be there talking about how the multi stage query engine works. We won't cover that today. But this story is still true. And sometimes it's more complicated than this now to be able to do things like joins and window functions and and things that, are, that, that, would just, that would break in this architecture. So Pino is, is growing in that way. Okay, uh, then you've got a machine called the controller. That's just kind of uh, uh, helping coordinate metadata changes, uh, like you know, new segments being added, new tables being created. And of course, all the, seg the metadata has persisted in Zookeeper. And finally, uh, there are these other little guys down here called minion workers. Technically, those are optional. You can be a Pino cluster without minion workers, but you would not be a very exciting one. Um, that is uh, this little sidecar distributed compute framework. If there's things you need to do, probably with segment files, that aren't precisely queries, like say, purge uh, GDPR records that have been deleted or uh, uh, doing other kinds of merging of old data and, and eliminating old records, things like that, with these quote unquote immutable segments, minions can go do that compute and IO off to the side and uh, uh, do that in a way that impacts servers less. They're also involved in ingesting data, which we may or, or may not cover. Uh, how do we read? Well, with SQL, and just like any other database, uh, picking your indexes, any other general purpose database, picking your indexes is kind of what reading is all about, and you've got a decent set of choices, uh, very pluggable, and, and the... The pluggability of indexes is another thing that Pino 1.0 just uh, made some improvements to. So this all uses the Java SPI uh, interface now. That's redundant. The Java service provider interface. Uh, so you can actually write and deploy a new index without rebuilding the Pino code if you're into that kind of thing. But pretty good set of indexes here. And uh, let's just talk about a couple of them. So the forward index is seems a little dull, but it's an important foundation. Now, if you remember that uh, 
nowhere is an entire row all together, okay? It just doesn't happen in a segment. They're all split up into columns. And so as rows are ingested, they're assigned a unique ID. It's not the same as the primary key. It's just an internal thing called the doc ID. So the doc ID is the identifier for a row. What the forward index does is if you have a doc ID, like, okay, I know what row I want. Now for a given column that has a forward index on it, tell me what the value of that doc ID is. So basically, this is just the, the, the way you get the value of a column, given that you, you somehow know the identity of the row, which helps us understand better the inverted index, which is just the opposite. The inverted index says, if I know the value, tell me what doc IDs have that value. And so if you have a relatively low cardinality column, usually a dimension column, right, not not a measurement, but some, some attribute of the measurement, then, uh, and, and there aren't so many unique values of that column, this can be handy in limiting the number of records that you'd have to scan, right? You'd get now a smaller number of doc IDs back from that thing, which is always what you want to do, right? You can't really scan all that much faster. If you're going to be reading columns off of storage, there's kind of just a maximum rate you can do that at. So Pino is always trying to, to do less scanning. And the inverted index is a common way of doing that. Now, that works for low cardinality things. I'm showing, you know, location here. Um, imagine you had uh, a number. That's like a, a real number or something like that. Um, not particularly a low cardinality if it's a, if it's a dimension or if it's a, just a measurement of something. Think of like a temperature or something. I mean, there are a lot of numbers. They're still, they're still technically discrete, but they're not all that discrete, right? Uh, so the range index is a thing that you can use to apply inverted index-like filtering to a numeric quantity. So you just break that numeric quantity up into ranges and then build an inverted index on top of that. So the range index actually generates a, uh, you know, an internal pseudo column with the value translated into the range and then just builds an inverted index on that. So you can do that. Timestamp column, same thing, just with time, explicitly with date time type columns, you can define a, 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 a grain. So in the actual table config, when you're defining the index, you could say something like day or minute or hour, and then it'll just zero out the part of the timestamp that is less than that. So if I want a day range here, you can see I go to minute and sec, sorry, hour and minute here in those timestamps. We would just zero those out and then build an inverted index on that discretized uh, timestamp. Probably the coolest index that everybody gets excited about in Pino is the star tree index. Uh, now, no actual relation to the name of the company, except obviously we took the name of the company from the index name, because it sounded cool. Or if you want to be less charitable than that, you could say it's an implementation detail that leaked into the interface, happens to all of us. Um, so Pino does not work by pre-aggregating, except in the case of the star tree index. Uh, star tree index is a way of saying, uh, of, of telling a table to pre-aggregate certain things uh, certain, uh, at certain measurements, certain queries uh, to optimize for that query. And specifically, that is the filter and aggregate kind of query, all right? So you've got select, average, temperature, where, blah, blah, blah. Say so there are three columns that might appear in the where clause. That formula right there is a bread and butter analytics query and the star tree index exists to optimize that. Typical, the typical experience of running the test of benchmarking without the index and then adding the index and benchmarking again is thinking something's broken and you're not measuring it right or it's cached or something because there's no way it could be that fast. You know, but that's, that's people, people, people do that. People wonder, is something messed up here? Because it's real fast. Let me tell you how it works. Okay, the example data is ad impressions here that I've got on the screen. There, the, the metric is impressions, and we want to compute um, a sum of those impressions. 
And there are three dimensions, country, browser, and locale. And we don't know which of those dimensions are going to show up as predicates in our query. So any number, you know, zero or all three of them might show up. And we always want to be able to compute uh, quickly uh, a number of impressions. The way that works is we literally build a tree. And if we want to, say, I always forget where the arrows are. Let's say we want to know all uh, the ad impressions for everybody using the Spanish locale. Okay, well, we start at the root node. And then country, we don't know. That doesn't show up in our predicates. So we're going to go to the wildcard country node. Browser, also not in our predicates. So we'll go to the, the wildcard browser node. And then under there, we have pre-computed all, uh, the, the, all of the, the Spanish impressions, the ES locale impressions, and there are 500. So I don't actually have to go read anything. I can just go to the index and, and get the value out. And I've got it right there. Uh, again, if you wanted all of the uh, French-speaking Canadians, uh, sorry, all, all um, English uh, Canadian users, we go to Canada, browser star, English, and there are 400. They're right there. So that's how it works. Uh, it's pretty cool. And it's a little more complex than this. You can say, you know, if you are going to scan fewer than 500 rows, you can tell the index, stop indexing, just have it, have it go do its normal scan then. Uh, but if you'd need more than 500, cause there's a trade-off there in terms of, of building an index and space and the time it takes to navigate the index versus the time it would take just to do the query. And, and so you can, you can turn those dials, but it ends up being a super cool thing. People get, uh, you know, P, P95 latencies in the small number of tens of milliseconds for practical data sizes and practical cluster deployments, which is pretty crazy. All right. Where to next? I'm going to be sure we have time for questions, um, but I also want to quickly talk about how to ingest data. Um, now, let's say... Uh, our data looks like that. So a little bit of uh, little bit of CSV data. This actually comes from a recipe on the Star Tree developer website. So pretty big data there. There's four records, but uh, it's easy to, to look at. The way we would ingest that is, first of all, create a schema file. I mentioned before, that's a, a JSON file. Pretty easy to understand. Um, we've got name and data type for each column, but the columns are broken up into three categories. There's dimensions, which are generally going to show up as predicates in the query or things that we group by. Metrics, which are probably things that we're going to aggregate. And um, then you've got date time fields, which are just a special category of dimension that gets special treatment. So there you go. There's your schema. And the table config file, this takes the place of a create table statement. Normally, uh, if, if you look at like vendor specific extensions of create table, there'll be create table, there's the schema, and then it'll be something like with, and then this big set of key value pairs. Uh, that just would have been a little messy. And uh, okay, so uh, then create index will be DDL that you'll add on to that. That's all wrapped up into one JSON file. So index definition, Whatever those set of with key value pairs, the extension, vendor specific extensions are all in there. And uh, we'll see in a minute for ingesting streaming data, there's the extra Kafka config is in there as well. Um, so you run a command line command to add the table. Uh, potentially a little bit of YAML. There's not very much YAML in Pinot, but a little bit. I see some people have phones out. Don't, don't, don't tweet a picture of the YAML if you. <laughs> if I could ask that. Um, anyway, then you run the, uh, you, you kick off that minion thing that I mentioned uh, to do that, that ingestion. The minions now are gonna say, oh, okay, here's this data source. It's either a file in the file system, more likely if it's batch data, it's like in a blob store somewhere, and it'll go, the controller will say, hey, you, minion, you have the task of going and reading from that blob store and actually creating a segment. So that minion job builds the segment file and then 
passes it off to the controller. The controller says, all right, that is going to live on server one. And as you continue ingesting data and in the, the controller distributes those throughout everywhere. Now, the much more interesting case is, and unfortunately, well, unfortunately, I just think it makes a lot more sense to look at batch ingestion first. But this is kind of what everybody cares about. This is why Pinot exists. It's so that you can read data from Kafka and make it queryable because logs aren't queryable. Logs are a great idea. Logs are an absolutely necessary part of life. Going back to my abbreviated view of history at the beginning, you know, in primordial history, we had mainframes, then we had client server, we had the web, which was client server, but with a more difficult user interface. And uh, that started not to work anymore because it didn't like the scale of the web. Client server didn't, didn't withstand the scale of the web. And so then we had, broadly speaking, microservices. I'll, I'll call that event-driven architecture. Some people distinguish between those two, but again, in, in broad strokes, that thing that we have and that thing, that microservices idea, seemed like it was having trouble getting traction and people being broadly successful with it until people started doing that with on top of Kafka, right? So that that finally was the... Can I say chocolate and peanut butter here? Is that, does that play well here? Back in the U.S., that's like, oh, yeah, those things that go so well together. And I, I don't know if that culture... No? <laughs> we really need to talk. Could we talk at the party? You might be missing out. But... Um, Help me, what's the, what, what, peanut butter and jelly? What, what's the, yeah, peanut butter and jelly. Oh, yeah, they go together like peanut butter and jelly. Great. Okay. Um, I, was always a, I was always a peanut butter and honey guy. I, I don't, try it. Okay, not doing well. There's, there go the ratings for the talk. Anyway, <laughs> until we had microservices and Kafka, it seemed like there was a lot of struggle. Now it seems like we've got a successful paradigm, meaning logs are an essential part of life now. Uh, it's just hard to ask them questions. So let's do this to them. Uh, the way this works is um, uh, you configure Pinot to ingest from a Kafka topic, and uh, it, it is actually a native Kafka consumer. There's no Kafka Connect. Uh, there, there's a, a great deal of subtlety in the way this works since it sort of co-evolved with Kafka, and it reads those, consumes those Kafka messages into this thing called a consuming segment, which is uh, it's an in-memory data structure. When it fills up, it gets flushed to a regular segment on disk. And so this real-time table consists of the consuming segment and whatever segments get created uh, after that. And on it goes, and we will see in the table config file, I would just like to point out right there, uh, I said this is a very intimate integration. It really is because Again, think, think of this as your create table statement. Create The table config is create table plus however many create index statements you would need, all wrapped into one beautiful piece of JSON. And bootstrap servers actually live in that file. So to create a real-time table, you are identifying the Kafka cluster, providing credentials, haha, not shown in this slide, uh, to connect to that cluster, the topic, and, you know, do you want to start at the beginning, start at the end, all that kind of stuff, uh, any other metadata associated with that Kafka connection, a real-time table that ingests from streaming data does not exist without a connection to Kafka. And, of course, it could be Pulsar, it could be Kinesis, there are other streaming services that exist uh, and are supported, but that's the idea. That's where that data comes from. Uh, and so that, that config lives there. Um, let me just skip a bit because there's a, a, a thing I want to point I want to make uh, about the the what's the word? It's called the intimacy of the integration. Uh, imagine this Kafka topic with three partitions. If you're a Kafka topic, you could be split up into partitions, and um, data is probably messages are probably assigned to those partitions based on the key of the message every message being a key value pair and that key probably means something important in the domain and it guarantees the ordering of the messages uh, it, rather it guarantees that messages in a topic of a common key are strictly ordered so you're usually thinking about that key a lot what if that key shows up as a predicate in your pinot queries later on 
that's not as big of an if as you might think. It's probably going to show up there somewhere. And so Kafka, or the Kafka Pinot integration gives you the opportunity to take this uh, partitioned topic and now individual servers will actually spin up consumers and Pinot under the covers if you're a Kafka person doesn't even use consumer groups. It doesn't want the cluster to be assigning partitions to pieces of the consumer here and there. Uh, it's in each server is individually saying, no, no, I'm taking partition zero. Kafka, I don't need your help with this. I, you, I'm taking partition one over here. So they, they have an opinionated assignment of partition to server. Uh, and of course that can be many to one. That's, that's fine. It doesn't need to be one to one like this. Uh, and that exists because now as those partitions are consumed and segments are created, what do we get? We get data locality based on partition key. Which, why, why, okay, when does that matter? Well, it matters if that partition key, let's say it's student ID, and in your table config, you're gonna say, okay, I know how this topic is configured. Uh, so, yep, that's the key there. I know it's murmur three, I'll pick that hash function. And now all of those messages are gonna show up next to each other in segments. They're actually not guaranteed to be on the same server long-term, they can be moved around. Anything can happen, but you're still gonna, relatively speaking, you're gonna have a lot more locality of, of those messages. So with this tight integration, you know, we get some goodies um, in exchange for, well, we just get some goodies. All right, I wanna take a few minutes for questions, but just briefly, uh, I said there was kind of another point in terms of the, the, the what has Kafka done to us and, and what has happened with the way we build application, uh, just the way we approach application architecture. Client server happened to mainframes. Client server has dominated the careers. I'm just looking around the room of, you know, probably all the software most of us have written in this, in this room uh, professionally. And that disruption in application architecture gave rise to a disruption in the way we do analytics. The web happened, mobile happened, those caused pressure eventually on, it took more than a decade, but those put pressure on the client server paradigm, on the data warehouse, caused us to have to do things differently, caused the rise of Kafka, which itself, I mentioned this, but I wanna emphasize it again, created pressure for things to happen right away. We, we don't get, we, there, there isn't a notion of, and if you remember early in the history of having internet, I don't know if some of you old enough to have used dial up, you actually had to go do things to get online. Well, you don't anymore, it's just there. And when it's not, it's a big pain. Like when I'm on an airplane and the internet goes out, I hate life, right? That's, that's a, an, an affront to my existence as a human being. Uh, and so now with that expectation that things happen all the time, people are finding that actually doing analytics, taking the data in the company, that, that was the whole thing with the data warehouse, right? The data is all scattered. Decision makers don't have visibility. They don't know what's going on in the business. It's okay, we'll put it in the data warehouse. We'll run a report. We will print it on a laser printer and we will hand the paper to you in the morning. You can see what happened yesterday. That was a game changer. Okay, that seems old fashioned now, but it, it was very important at the time. Well, what's happening now is take all that data and yes, of course, decision makers should get dashboards. If those dashboards refresh every 15 minutes, pff, that's great. That, that's great for business analysts. That, they love in life, okay? What about us on the outside of the business? As users, people are finding you can create stickier, more engaging, more interesting, more valuable experiences by taking all that data and exposing it to us, turning it into product features, making all of us now basically into decision makers in that community of application users. So that, I think, is the crazy thing that's happening here with all of the disruption of microservices, event-driven architecture, Kafka, these entirely new ways of building applications that are different than we've been doing for however long we've been doing it. We've got this new paradigm to deal with now. That is its own set of problems, but this idea that the users of our applications actually wanna know what's going on inside the system, that requires a new kind of infrastructure. That's, I think, why Pinot exists. Certainly why Pino was built. And that gets us to a few minutes for questions. <laughs>